It has been quite a week. Vaccinations, outbreaks, lockdowns, a new U.S. president, a governor general resigns. And all the while, we are locked down and closed in. But in this moment, we come to worship. This moment may look like any other moment, but it is different. Worship is that moment that we remind ourselves that even in isolation, we are not alone. God is with us. And in that realization, every other moment changes. So come. Open up. Recognize the light and life of God with us all. Welcome to Worship at Jubilee. And on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide. And on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide. On this path, the gates of the holiness are open. We begin by acknowledging that the community of Jubilee is a broad community. We don't all live in the same neighborhood. Many of us are connecting virtually now. And we don't shop in the same stores or walk along the same paths. And we also arrive to this moment from very different paths emotionally. Some of us are in pain, looking for comfort. Others are here in joy, wanting to share. Some have arrived with heavy burdens, wanting to repent, turn things around for themselves, for the world. And some of us just showed up. Jubilee, virtually and in person, aspires to be a safe place for you, your children, the stranger. We are a place where you can share your hurt, your joy, your visions, and your questions. We are grateful for the love that makes it possible for us to be together, supporting without needing to see things the same way. 
We are an affirming community, which means that we are a safe and welcoming place for all those who express their identity in the LGBTQ2S plus communities. That's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirited. Those who identify as he or she, but also those who are non-binary and don't use such terms or identities. Those who are helping us to understand the beautiful diversity of humanity. We give thanks that we are all created in God's image, meant and empowered to reveal, receive, and share love. We also give thanks for those whose lives, communities, and wisdom were here long before any settlers arrived. We speak of the Batum, the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas of the New Credit, and many others. The place that we call Toronto was a diverse and dynamic community long before any settlers arrived. Indigenous peoples had commerce and travel and permanency and stewardship, history, artistry, drama, ceremony, health care, politics, justice, peacekeeping, all of these things, and they still do. They weren't looking for salvation when settlers arrived, but they were open to good relations. Historically, we have failed at this. We have been colonial when we could have been cooperative. We created residential schools, the pain and and the trauma of which continues to damage lives to this day. We continue in a world where systemic racism, violence, and indifference continue to denigrate the lives of Indigenous peoples. And so we are committed to living up to the promises and the treaties that began our relationship. Jubilee has established the Jubilee Reconciliation Fund that provides financial support to the Toronto Urban Native Ministry and also provides opportunity for our community to learn more history and embrace Indigenous tradition and culture and live into the hope of reconciliation. And as for you, whatever has brought you here this morning, bless you. We're glad you're here. You are welcome. You are valued. You are loved. You are not alone. We begin our announcements with the sad news that our dear friend Nancy Rowe passed away earlier this week as a result of complications of COVID-19. In time, there will be a small family service but a beautiful sugar maple has been planted at Balsam Lake beside her late husband Doug's memorial bench. You know, on November 29th, Nancy was able to celebrate her 91st birthday by attending her grandson's baptism here at Jubilee. It was a great day for her. It was a great day for those of us who could celebrate with her. Many people know Nancy as the lady with the electric wheelchair. And in fact, Nancy has entrusted Jubilee to find a good home for that wheelchair. Nancy would encourage friends who wish to honor her memory to make a donation to Jubilee United Church. For now, we hold Nancy, her family, and friends in our hearts and in our prayers. As you can probably understand, in current conditions, Jubilee United Church is not having live in-person services. We will let you know when we are able to gather in person again, but we assume it won't be for many weeks yet. But with virtual services, with reaching out to each other, I'm sure that we are able to focus on God's presence in our homes and in our lives. Please know that you are not alone. As usual, there will be a check-in for kids and parents today at 2 p.m. with Haley Brown. The Zoom link is on our website. And we are still looking for some help with Black History Month. It is coming up in February. If you have ideas for ways that Jubilee United Church can observe, celebrate, and embrace Black History Month, please let me know. Norm Seeley. That would be N-S-E-L-I at jubileeunited.ca. Last week, I was saying that we're looking for a little bit of tech help with our annual meeting. So far, no puppies have come forward. In fact, nobody has yet come forward, so I'll let you know we're still looking for somebody to help manage the Zoom meeting. It won't be difficult. We will offer training, and you will be providing an invaluable service. 
please let me know or speak with Diane in the office if you will be able to help us. And of course, I want pictures, lots of pictures, pictures of life, your life, life around you that we can use in our church services. Please don't hesitate to send them to me, n-s-e-l-i at jubileeunited.ca. Last Monday, 18 of us gathered together to watch the first episode of First Contact and to talk about it, and we were amazed. And tomorrow we're going to do it again. However, we're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to have discussion at 8 o'clock. If you would like to watch the episode with us, you can join us through Zoom at 7.15 and we'll watch the episode together. But if you would rather watch the episode today, in advance, or just on your own computer, you can go to tvo.org, search for First Contact Season 1, and you'll find all three episodes there. Tomorrow night, we'll be watching Episode 2. And we are pretty excited that on Thursday, February 4th, from 7.30 to 9 p.m., we will have our first monthly gathering to be social, to learn something, to hear about something that we don't know. John Sharp will be sharing a stamp collector visits Antarctica. Lots of pictures, and John will be there to answer questions. So come on out and have some fun with us. The first Thursday of the month, beginning February 4th. We are aware that several people in the Jubilee community like to journal. So honoring the journalers, Cheryl Colford has come up with a suggestion. We know things have been challenging, unprecedented times continue, which can be stressful and frustrating. So for some, journal writing can be therapeutic, but it can be hard to figure out where to start. So we have compiled a collection of journal prompts and we'll share two of them every Sunday. Choose whichever one you like best or, or choose both. Your writing is for you only. You're not turning it in, we're not sharing it. We just hope that you will find it beneficial, illuminating, challenging, and fun. So please, enjoy. And this week, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Or, what do you need more of in your life? Hey, if you are interested in helping Jubilee continue to be a place that connects and inspires folks in 2021, you know, a community that isn't waiting for the pandemic to end, but is actively imagining and creating new ways to be community, to connect with God and to share a ministry. Well, you're invited to support us financially. You know, you can send money by e-transfer to admin at jubileeunited.ca, or you can send money online by going to Canada Helps and looking for Jubilee United Church, the one in Ontario, not the one in Burnaby, BC. Oh, and we also love getting checks uh, made payable to Jubilee United Church in the mail. Those always work. And when you support us financially, you can direct your funds to the Jubilee Benevolent Fund, um, to the United Church Mission and Service Fund, or you can just let Jubilee decide how to use the money the best. However you decide to support us financially, actively by volunteering, uh, by engaging in community, or by simply being willing to connect, to share, and to grow with us, we are really glad that we are in this community and in this ministry together. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being part of Jubilee. As I come to light the Christ candle, I am aware that this Sunday falls between two Mondays. I know, all Sundays do, but, but tomorrow is Robbie Burns Day, a day in which some of us will remember Scotland's beloved 18th century poet. Last Monday was a day that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was remembered and celebrated in the U.S., both men believed in the equality and the potential of all humanity. 
They would typically use the word man, but they spoke of humanity, not defined by privilege or poverty, race or context, but equal with the potential to respect, honor, and love one another. I will begin by reading A Man's a Man for that, a poem written by Robbie Burns in 1795. I apologize in advance. I will do it in dialect, but we'll put the English words on the screen as well. And then I will light the Christ candle and then follow with Dr. King's prayer for the churches. Is there for honest poverty that hings at heed and a that? A coward slave we passing by, we dare be a fool for a that. For a that and a that, our toils obscure and a that. The rank is but the guinea's stamp, the man's the goud for a that. What though in him le fair we dine, we are hot and grey and a that. Ye fools their silks and knaves their wine, a man's a man for a that. For a that and a that, their tinsel show and a that, the honest man, though he say poor, is king of man for a that. You see yon darky, called a lord, what struts and stares and a that. Though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a coof for a that. For a that and a that, he's the running star and a that. The man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at a that. A prince can mark a belted mate, a marquis duke and a that. But an honest man's about his might, good faith, he a man of a that. For a that and a that, their dignities and a that, the pith of sense and pride of worth, a higher rank than a that. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for a that, that sense and worth o'er all the earth shall bear the gree and a that. For a that and a that, it's coming yet for a that, that man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for a that. In every instance where we treat each other with respect and dignity, when we recognize that we are all children of God, when we love each other like it matters, we share the light of Christ. Thank you for your church, founded upon your word, that challenges us to do more than sing and pray. But go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depends on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together. Pray together. Sing together. And live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, brown, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the reign of our Lord and of our God. We pray.
Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your eyes. And God, may I never lightly presume to preach your word. And may we never lightly presume to hear your word. For in your word is abundant life. Amen. So, I don't know if you've heard this, but apparently the latest thing to help us get through this pandemic, well, it's not a new thing, actually. It's, it's an old thing. It's a very old thing. Sea shanties. That's apparently the thing we need. Sea shanties. The, the work songs of sailors. This idea of all being in it together, the simplicity, the energy of it. This is the thing that we need. And, and I, I'm not kidding, they are all over TikTok right now. And, and, and I heard about this on CBC, so you know it's true for old people too, right? What shall we do to get through COVID? What shall we do to get through COVID? What shall we do to get through COVID? Singing seems annoying. But way hey and up she rises, way hey and up she rises, way hey and up she rises. Yeah, that still seems annoying. <laughs> so, there, D did that help? Oh, good. Because let's be honest, we need some help right now. You know, the call to stay home and help overcome this pandemic, well, it's an easy one for some of us, right? We hear it. We get it, we're doing it. We may quibble on what's essential, perhaps, but, but we're mostly doing it. But for others, and we see them, it's not easy. They don't understand, or they don't appreciate, they don't trust. I mean, whatever it is, some folks just aren't hearing the call. For some, a call by God is easy, like we heard in the stories today. God sent Jonah to Nineveh to get them to repent. Well, what's to doubt, right? God calls, you do what you're told. The lads, they were working the fishing boats when Jesus invited them to follow. And it says in the story, they did immediately. They, right away, they understood, they appreciated, they trusted. How about you? 
I'm not talking pandemic right now. I'm talking about God calling. Could you do it? Would you do it? You know, understand? Appreciate? Trust? Immediately? I, I, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, honestly, as handsome as I am, I have no problem wearing a mask. But just following... And just to be clear, okay, um, the little bit of Jonah that we heard, that's not the whole story. <laughs> not even close. Jonah, um, he understood. But I don't think that he appreciated what he was being asked to do. And I am pretty sure that he didn't trust God's judgment. And then he proceeded to do something that, you know, I've done once or twice. Maybe you have too. Uh, Jonah did his best to avoid doing what God was asking him to do. Only to end up doing it anyway and then wondering why he wasted so much time trying to avoid it. You might need a little more of the story, so, so allow me. Let me fill the story out for you. Okay, there's a whale. And, and not at the beginning, but I'm going to start there because, because when most people hear about the whale, they tend to tune out, right? Because, let's be serious, nobody gets swallowed by a whale and lives to tell about it. Except Pinocchio. And Pinocchio's not real. The story of Jonah and the whale is unbelievable. Absolutely. Not history. Not real. <laughs> a whale. I mean, <laughs> it's silly. But if you think that the whale is silly, you really do need to hear the whole story. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, it's not a long story, but you probably don't have time to read all three chapters, so, so I, I, I am summarizing. Once upon a time, there was a man named Jonah. <laughs> and he wasn't just any man, he was a faithful man. He knew deep in his bones, be, behind his eyes, he knew throughout his very soul, he, he knew the power of God. And he was faithful. Jonah was also a preacher, and not just any preacher. He was a great preacher. He knew all of the best words. He didn't use Twitter or social media. He spoke to people in, in person, and he spoke with complete sentences and even paragraphs at times. And when he spoke, ugh, people swooned, hearts burst, minds opened, and real change occurred. He preached the word of God, and people got it. And they didn't send him money or prayer requests. They didn't follow him on Instagram. They actually turned their lives around. So one day, God tells Jonah to go to the mighty city of Nineveh and preach to them. Go to the city so mighty, so large, that it would take a man three days to walk across. I want you just to imagine that for a moment. A healthy man only stopping a couple times at Starbucks or Subway for sustenance, right? Healthy man like that could walk 36 miles a day, which would include, you know, an hour for lunch, an hour for dinner, a couple hours of TV, eight hours of sleep, all of that's built in. So it's safe to say that the city of Nineveh is at least 108 miles across. Got it? It would stretch from Waterloo, through Milton, Mississauga, Etobicoke, Toronto, Scarborough, Pickering, Whitby, Oshawa, and likely stretch from Lake Ontario all the way up to Perry Sound. This Nineveh, it's big. And it's also full of sinners. So God tells Jonah to go to this mighty city 
and tell them that in 40 days they will be destroyed, wiped out, erased, for all of their wicked, sinful ways. And that will teach them to deny the results of an election, or turn their backs on their neighbors, or ignore safe distancing and mask wearing, ignore the cries of small businesses. I, I'm just speculating. I don't know exactly what wicked things they did, okay? I mean, it could be that they cheered for the haves. I have no idea. But they did something wicked in God's sight. Now, Jonah, he's at first gladdened by the news because he hates the Ninevites. Can't stand them. I mean, we don't know why, but he has been secretly hoping for a very long time that they would all die. And now... Now God's going to make it happen. Yes. But he also knows that as great a preacher as he is, as soon as he breaks the news to the king and to the people of Nineveh, they're going to repent. And then God isn't going to wipe them out. And now, having just imagined them being wiped out, he can't abide the idea of them surviving. You kind of felt that at all lately? I know that I've heard it expressed by more than a couple of folks, just wishing that some people maybe wouldn't quite survive. So rather than doing what God has asked him, actually what God has commanded him to do, rather than go to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction. Jonah decides to run away from the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God that he knows and loves so well. Because you can totally do that, right? Hide from the one who knows and sees everything. And you thought the whale was the silly part of the story. <laughs> but wait, it gets better. Deciding to get away from God and avoid saving the Ninevites, Jonah gets on a boat and he sails in the direction opposite Nineveh. Hoping, I suppose, that God won't be able to pick up his trail on water. Apparently God's like a bloodhound or something, I don't know. But alas, the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God somehow manages to track Jonah into the boat and on to the sea. Don't you sometimes wonder if it shouldn't be on the boat and into the sea? I suppose that when he boarded, he went below and therefore I guess got in the boat. But as the boat floats, he was on the sea and not... Anyway, it's kind of confusing to me. Apparently, it was confusing for God, too. Because God didn't seem to want Jonah on or in the boat. God did want him in the sea. And so a storm arises, and the crew panics as they recognize divine intervention. And then Jonah volunteers to go overboard and save the boat and the crew. And so, boop, into the sea he goes, ready to drown anything to not save the Ninevites. Now, of course, we, we'd never be like that, right? Like, we'd never go in the opposite direction when our help is needed or when we might be able to follow God's will. <laughs> no. None of us have ever distracted ourselves from someone in need by, I don't know, changing the channel or starting an argument. None of us have ever pretended to be talking on the phone so that we could walk past someone that we didn't want to talk to. We've never put off a decision for so long that eventually there's nothing we can actually do about it, so, <laughs> sorry. None of us have ever let anger or hatred poison our own lives. I think we need a, a shanty break. I don't want to be like Jonah, I don't want to be like Jonah, I don't want to be like Jonah, running away from God. Way hey, up she rises, way hey, up she rises, way hey, up she rises, run away from God. But God has another plan, and sends a large fish. Some say a whale. I've read one scholar who feels strongly that it was a hippopotamus. 
but I'm going to stick with fish. Um, a large fish swallows up Jonah. Silly enough for you yet? Oh, <laughs> and then awake in the belly of the fish, where the smell must have been mm, delightful, Jonah takes time to offer to God a prayer of thanksgiving. You know, because things are working out so well for him. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Somehow, and I do not know how, Jonah finds hope in this dark, smelly sushi cave. He finds light in the midst of such darkness. He finds stillness for his soul.
Now, after three days, and it must have felt like a lot more to Jonah, uh, the fish vomits Jonah up on the shore. I want you to picture that, if you will. Mm. Three days in the belly of a fish, and now sitting in the sand, covered in fish vomit. And you'll never guess where. <laughs> Just outside of Nineveh. And then God reminds Jonah of the original request, or should I say command, uh, as if the, his scene reversed peristalsis. That's a nice way of saying fish vomit. Wasn't always part of the plan. Jonah goes into Nineveh declaring that God is going to destroy them for their wickedness in 40 days. And as Jonah suspected, the people are moved, the king is moved, and immediately the king trades his royal robes for sackcloth and sits himself down in ashes, which are all customary signs of humility, mourning, and repentance. <laughs> Who knew that my sons, when they were teenagers, they weren't messy at all. They were, they were just repenting. Huh, go figure. Anyway, the king declares a 40-day fast and instructs that all animals will also fast. No food, no drink. And I don't know if you've ever farmed before, um, but keeping your livestock away from food or water for 40 days is one, no small feat, and two, not really good for the well-being of the herd. But it's the whale that seems silly, right? And if the fast isn't enough, the king also declares that all of the animals, all right, in a kingdom that stretches from Waterloo to Oshawa, Lake Ontario to Perry Sound, all of those animals, from the cows to the sheep to the little puppies and the kittens, that they also will be wearing sackcloth and will sit in ashes. Because apparently they too are wicked and they need to repent. Because <laughs> nobody likes the taste of unrepentant mutton. Now, I don't want to spoil things for you, because I am sure that you will be rushing to your Bible to read the story as soon as this service is over, no doubt. But the people, they do as instructed by their king, and they convince God of their sincerity. Moreover, God is moved by this remarkable, universal expression of remorse and repentance. And God changes God's mind sparing Nineveh and the Ninevites and all the puppies and all the kittens. Minimum wage goes up, local businesses are supported, folks don masks without argument, vaccines happen, and all is right with the world. Again, I'm just speculating. But time for a shanty break. <laughs> Maybe we could be like Jonah, maybe we could be like Jonah, maybe we could be like Jonah, helping heal our neighbors. Way, hey, and up she rises, way, hey, and up she rises, way, hey, and up she rises, helping heal our neighbors. Now the story could end right here. You know, happy ending for everybody. But we know the truth. You and me, we know. Sometimes we do the right thing because we have to, but we're still not really happy about it. Jonah, he looks out over Nineveh, a city no longer under threat of divine destruction, thanks to his compelling and charismatic oratory. And that means he talks good. This preacher of good news, this man who can turn hearts, declares in his best Arnold Schwarzenegger impression, I'll not be back. And with that, Jonah sat himself down on the outside of the city and sulked. He sulked for so long that God grew a tree beside him to provide shade. And then because God felt that it might be time for Jonah to suck it up and get on with things, God sent a worm to bite the tree root and then the tree died. Jonah, of course, was sad about the tree's death. It seemed so unfair that the tree should die. This man who wanted a multitude of Ninevites, including kittens and puppies, to die, he was bereft over the death of his best friend, the tree. But it's the whale that seems silly. 
And yet in all the silliness, you might also wonder, Nineveh, is it really a city in the ancient world? A city that's over a hundred miles across? Or could Nineveh, could Nineveh be that big, looming, scary thing that we try to keep away, but its sheer size means that we can never really get away from it? Maybe we should call Nineveh climate change, poverty, the widening gap between the rich and the poor. Maybe we should call it racism or hashtag me too, social division. Maybe we should call it violence, colonialism, ignorance, addiction. So, so big, too, too big. I, I can't make a difference. So I'm going to ignore it. But the story tells us that we can do something about these things. We can make a difference. Jonah did. We don't believe that we can. After all, I'm just one man. What can I possibly do about climate change? Jonah got in a boat and went away. I didn't look. What can I do about poverty? I mean, I only have a couple bucks to spare. Jonah, he got swallowed by a whale rather than try. Systemic racism. I'm an old white guy, what can I do? I mean, nobody wants to listen to me. Jonah invested all of his feelings uh, in a tree. How'd that work out? You see, the story might poke at us, and you might become surprised at what your, your time can do, what your voice can do to inspire others, what your dollars can do, what your following and supporting might actually mean. You might be surprised at how you can make space and listen to new voices. You'll be amazed at the influence you have over the people who are closest to you. These looming, seemingly impossible, large problems might not be as hopeless as we think. So stop running away. Stop hiding. I mean, it might seem silly, but you might just be the difference. You. And maybe, like Jonah, you don't really want to. I get it. Sometimes we don't want to make a difference because, well, because we're afraid. Or we know that changing the world might mean that we have to change and we've just figured out how to be the way we are. Or as bad as things are, we're invested in the way that things are and things aren't bad for us. And sometimes we don't want to because, well, because like Jonah, we don't like the people that the change is going to benefit. We just don't. We don't really want mercy for our enemies. We would rather see punishment, even death. I mean, what if I told you that for $100, you could send a terrorist to summer camp, and at summer camp, they might give up their violent ways? They might. Would you give me the money? Or would you hold back? Because you know what? There is no way that a violent killer, a dis disrespecter of life, deserves to learn how to canoe and make lanterns. Yeah. What if I told you that hugging a member of whatever group of people you dislike the most, what if I told you that by hugging them and inviting them over for dinner, you might be able to help them change their ways and stop hurting people and ruining the world? Would you get out of the good china? Or would you say, there is no way that so-and-so is sitting at my table, not with my family. They shouldn't even be allowed in this community. What about the child molester, the drug dealer, the leader of that political party? Your cousin Ron, who still hasn't apologized. What if you could help them become good people? Happy people. But they'd never thank you for it. Would you help? Jonah, he hates child molesters. And he hates terrorists. And he can't stand his cousin Rob. 
And he does not want those Ninevites to get off without paying for their wickedness. The problem is that Jonah believes in a merciful God. A God of second chances. Jonah got a second chance. Third and a fourth if you count. God told him again and again to go to Nineveh and prodded him along until he got there. Jonah knows that God is a God of second chances, but he doesn't like it. He would prefer a God that loves him and works for him, forgives his sin while keeping track of the sins of others, allows Jonah to keep track of the sins of others too, and then hold on to the grudges and the hurt. Because as long as he can stay angry with the Ninevites, or his cousin Rob, he can protect himself from being hurt again. The problem is that it's very hard to keep bitterness and anger focused on one thing or on one person. It tends to spread. How silly is that? I mean, you just want to hate one person and then you end up angry with everyone. God has a remedy. Mercy. Second chances. It is such an infuriating concept. Allowing the people we despise a second chance. I mean, it's such an infuriating concept that you really have to hide it in a story that makes you laugh. Otherwise, otherwise you'd never listen. <laughs> You'd cover your ears. You would insist that it's a fairy tale and that it never happened. But in the humor of this story, something does seem to ring true, doesn't it? God goes to ridiculous, silly lengths for us to give us another chance. I have never been swallowed by a fish, but I have had more than a few second chances even seventh and eighth chances, I think. As you listen to the story, you might also have noticed that we can change God's mind. You and me. The Ninevites. God listens and God responds. In this story, God changes. It's just Jonah who refuses to change. God changes. But we often don't. How silly is that? But you know what? That might be a sermon for another day. I think we should just have one more shanty break and then move on. We love a God of second chances. We love a God of second chances. We love a God of second chances who brings all to the table. Way hey and up she rises, way hey and up she rises, way hey and up she rises, God's love's not a fable. Thanks be to God. Amen. How do we come to prayer today? We come sharing our hurt, our joy, our worry, and our love. We give thanks for frontline workers, essential workers, teachers, parents, leaders, and followers. We pray for their safety, their strength, and their well-being. We pray for those who are on our hearts, the ones we love who are far away beyond our reach. We pray for the ones we love who are nearby, but kept away.
We pray for strangers on the street, homeless and afraid. We pray for those who are barely hanging on right now, needing every bit of kindness that can be found. We pray for those who are sick with COVID-19. And we pray for those who are sick of this pandemic. Strength, patience, hope are our prayers. We pray for ourselves, for we too need strength, patience, and hope. And we pray that we might listen and hear God's prayers. Hear what God is asking of us in this moment. Understand how and where we can make a difference. This is how we pray. And so we lift up our hearts, we lift up each other, we lift up our world, praying in the way that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go forth from this moment and don't be afraid to follow God's call. And if you struggle with it this time, there will be another chance and another chance. But why wait? Know that God the Creator loves you and calls you. Know that Jesus walks with us and makes sure that we're not alone as we risk, as we dare. And know that the Holy Spirit absolutely surrounds and fills each and every one of us, making it possible to follow God's call, making it possible to change the world. Until we gather again virtually or in person,
Thank you.